Greetings, everyone. Welcome back for the second half of our morning session. My name is Jim Fallows from the Atlantic Monthly Magazine, and we're going to hope to continue the high level of excitement and interest we've had for the first part of the program. James Wolfenson mentioned in his opening remarks that it was almost exactly two years ago that the failure of Lehman Brothers began the economic consequences we've been coping with ever since then. This stuck in my mind because it was almost exactly two years ago at a zeitgeist that was held on the Google campus in Mountain View that I had the chance to interview a man named Gao Xiqing. He was then and is now the head of the China Investment Corporation. And the 24 hours before he came on stage to be interviewed in front of the crowd, he had been responsible for a larger financial market loss than any other single person in human history because he was in charge of China's holdings in the world markets. And so tens, hundreds of billions of dollars went away. Nonetheless, he came to our conference. Nonetheless, he answered questions, and he soldiered on, and he said what he was going to try to do. I reflected on leadership as involved people like Mr. Gao. This was a person who, in his teenage years, was building railroads in Manchuria during the Cultural Revolution, who then went to Duke Law School, and one of the first Chinese students, then was a Wall Street lawyer, and then came back in the 1980s to help rebuild China's economy. It's, we've heard about the strengths of China and India's growth in this morning's session. Leaders like that are part of the strength that these countries have. They have their weaknesses, but that's some of the, the strength. We know that when it comes to the U.S. economy, U.S. institutions, Western institutions, there are many questions about the caliber of leadership. Leadership in the political realm. Leadership in the media realm. We can't all be Ted Turner, much as it would be uh, nice to imagine. Leadership in the military realm. Leadership in the financial sphere. This and the rest of this morning's program, before our lunch break, we're going to explore these various dimensions of leadership from people who have lessons to teach about the experience they've, they've been through. We're going to begin with an academic specialist, as you've already been queued up by Christian Freeland, who has made a science of how people can make themselves more optimistic and more positive-minded. Then we're going to have a Q&A discussion with somebody who's in the middle of a very impressive turnaround. Then we're going to hear from a, uh, a leader of an industry that itself is going through huge shifts of its underlying market position. Then another Q&A discussion with somebody who has completed a very, very successful leadership of a mature company. Then we're going to have a surprise for you, too. So that's what's in store between now and our lunch break. Um, there will be time during the, when, after the, at, before the surprise and after these initial presentations. We're going to have all of the speakers come on stage, and that will be the chance for all of you to have a Q&A. So that's our ambition for these next uh, 90 or 100 minutes, to look at different aspects of leadership from people who have lived this, this world. To begin this presentation, we have the great honor of hearing from Martin Seligman, whose official title is the Zillerbach Professor at the University of Pennsylvania and a man who has received essentially every honor that his field can bestow, his field of, of, uh, of uh, psychology. That he's won research awards. He also won, I gather, by a historic FDR scale landslide, the presidency of his professional organization. So we can see his political skills, too. His relevance, among his relevances here for our discussion, is the study he's done on learned optimism, of being able to develop the traits that Ted Turner, among others, displayed so naturally and so effortlessly uh, in our previous session. He has a book coming out next year called Flourish. And so please join me in welcoming Martin Seligman for our initial presentation. So it falls to me to articulate a positive vision of the human future. Uh, I don't know if I can do that, but I think I can talk about what the prologue has to be to a positive human future. I don't think we can have one unless we envision it. So what I'm going to do is talk about uh, what is positive psychology, what is well-being, and uh, positive in interventions that build these things. And finally, I want to talk about uh, the relationship of flourishing in individuals to nations to corporations. So let's start with uh, uh, what is positive psychology. Uh, where I came from and where psychology came from, I came from working on misery. I spent my life working on helplessness, depression, suicide, uh, and uh, uh, 
As Jim mentioned, when I became president of my association, I looked around uh, over a decade ago and asked, what do psychologists do well? And we do misery and suffering well. Uh, and what don't we do at all? We don't ask what makes life worth living and can there be a science of the positive side of life. So my mission for the last 12 years has been to shepherd the science, uh, the funding, the, the practice, the possibility that there could be uh, a rigorous science and a useful practice of what makes life worth living. So that's what the next 18 minutes uh, are about. And uh, in this view, it says that uh, positive psychology should uh, be just as concerned with human strength as it is with weakness, uh, uh, to quantify it and to ask how to build it. It should be just as interested in uh, making what is best in life as with repairing pathology. Uh, it should be just as concerned with your lives and the lives of your children as it is with uh, uh, people in great trouble. Uh, and by the way, I don't mean this as a displacement of uh, social science as usual, but rather as a supplement. Uh, and finally, uh, 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 psychology and psychiatry have to develop interventions not just to decrease suffering, but to increase well-being and flourishing. And it turns out that's different. As you probably know, Schopenhauer and Freud both believed the best we could ever do was to minimize our misery. And I think that's profoundly incorrect. And uh, I'll talk about evidence against that. We want to reduce misery, but we want to build flourishing. So um, what is well-being in this model? Well, in, in this model, there's an acronym for it, PERMA. Uh, the claim, and in many ways, Ted Turner gave my speech, and it falls to me to say what he might mean and how, how, how if one can't afford dire pessimism, what are the elements that one should think about in building? Uh, so PERMA says there are four uh, components, each one of which is measurable and each one of which uh, there is reason to think is buildable. The first is positive emotion, what generally called uh, happiness, the subjective hedonics of life. Uh, the second is positive relationships. Uh, the third is meaning and purpose in life and uh, the fourth is accomplishment. So flourishing, from my point of view, um, asks the question, how do you measure those things with rigor? How do you measure them in individuals? How do you measure them in nations? How can you measure them globally? Uh, and uh, ask how to build them. What do we know about the building of these matters? So um, uh, there's a, too short a time to take you through the science underlying this. but. Uh, what I'll do is, is take you through uh, just three representative kinds of scientific endeavors that people in positive psychology do. Um, so, uh, uh, and I'll do it for individuals, since that's mostly what I've spent my life working on. So I spent a lot of time, uh, it, 40 years ago, I discovered a phenomenon called learned helplessness. And that was basically that when animals and people confront events that they can't control, they collapse, they become passive, they become stupid, their brain changes, uh, they become more susceptible to illness and the like. And uh, uh, research on this went on for about 15 years, probably about a thousand articles in the literature on the phenomenon. But what no one ever pointed out is when I brought people and animals to my laboratory and I gave them unsolvable problems, inescapable noise, uh, only about two-thirds of them became helpless. One-third I could not make helpless. So I asked the question, what was it about the third of you who, even though you face uh, uh, adversity, allows you to bounce back and not become, become helpless? So a field grew up called learned optimism in what, what people looked at is uh, before going to the laboratory or before uh, uh, a divorce, uh, what's your theory of setbacks in life? 
And it turned out those people who believed that setbacks in life were temporary as opposed to permanent, were controllable as opposed to uncontrollable, and were local. You know, I'm just bad at math, I'm not stupid, uh, rather than pervasive. That was the third who never became helpless. So that's kind of an ex I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna do optimism for all three examples. So we now have a pretty good handle on picking out in advance people who don't become helpless. Um, so we then went on to ask in high-level athletics, could you predict um, what athletes were going to do after defeat? So we took our whole 1988 uh, uh, Olympic swimming team. And by the way, the reason it's important to do it in athletics and in swimming in particular, uh, the uh, relay events follow the individual events. And so if a great swimmer does badly, you want to know whether or not he's going to be deflated or inflated, whether or not to put him in the relays. So um, what we did is, here's what we did with Matt Biondi. We did it with all of the swimmers. Uh, uh, the coach said, uh, Matt, into the pool, swim the 100 fly. Biondi swam it in 50.1. He came out and North said, 52.5, terrible time. Rest up for 20 minutes and swim it again. Biondi's in the upper quartile of optimism and the way I defined it. It's temporary, it's local, and it's controllable. He swam it the second time in 49.9. But what we find in general in uh, Major League Baseball, in basketball, in Olympic swimming, is that the optimists get better uh, after defeat, and the pessimists get slower. So that's a second kind of study that emerges from the literature. Um, and uh, a third kind is, is physical health itself. And, there's a, you know, looking around uh, how male and what your age is, uh, most of you are going to die about, of cardiovascular stuff. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> we're, we're quite interested in quantifying risk factors for cardiovascular death. So, in, uh, uh, so we measure cholesterol, blood pressure, all the usual risk factors, but we also measure optimism. And uh, you statistically can hold uh, traditional risk factors constant and ask to uh, quantify what is the effect of optimism relative to other risk factors. So in a recent study of 1,000 uh, Dutch 65-year-olds, uh, we measured all these things. We followed them for 10 years. 350 died of cardiovascular stuff. Uh, hold, uh, holding constant all traditional risk factors, the upper quartile of Ted Turnerisms in optimism uh, uh, has one quarter the risk of cardiovascular death of the rest of the population. And this has been replicated uh, quite a number of times. We're fascinated by the, the cardiovascular mechanisms that might produce that. So those are three examples of the kind of thing that science does. Um, so less depression, more achievement, uh, particularly under adversity, better physical health are three uh, well-documented consequences of optimism. So in the well-being formulation, PERMA basically says what, what we want to measure rigorously and then intervene on if we can, and what a positive human future is about, is this question of building well-being. Uh, building positive emotion, building positive relationships, building meaning and purpose, and building uh, accomplishment. Um, so, are these, thing, are these things like uh, your waistline? Uh, I, you, I'm going to offend some of you. There's a $50 billion American dieting industry. It's a scam. Uh, the reason it's a scam is that any of you can lose 5% uh, of your body weight in about three weeks by following any diet on the bestseller list. I did the watermelon diet and lost 20 pounds. Uh, I had diarrhea for a month. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the problem is uh, uh, 85 to 95 percent of people regain all that weight or more in the next three to five years. So the question about interventions is whether or not building positive emotion, relationships, meaning, accomplishment is like dieting, boosterism, or you get back. So uh, let me take you through the kind of things people who do intervention in this uh, uh, area. Uh, 
I'm a naughty thumb of science person. I spent a lot of my life testing drugs and psychotherapies in random assignment placebo-controlled tests. And so when I started working on the positive side of life, I began to say, well, uh, can you ask what peop makes people happier in random assignment placebo-controlled testing? And from the Buddha to modern pop psychology, there have been about 200 suggestions about what makes people flourish. So a lot of what we do is we take those suggestions, we put them on the web, we do random assignment placebo control. And we found about 12 to 18 of them actually seem to lastingly increase these variables. Uh, and so let me see. Uh, so with individuals, here's an example of something that, that lasts, if you put it on the web with no human hands, if this was I think you're getting a copy of my book, Authentic Happiness, so you can actually do this. In, the, in that book, there's something called uh, Signature Strengths Tests, which asks kindness, fairness, gratitude, what are your highest strengths? So uh, we have people take the Signature Strengths Tests, and then we say, okay, um, take something you have to do at work every week that you don't like doing, and figure out how to do that tedious task using your highest strength. Uh, so for example, one of, my, one, of my, one of the people I worked with was a bagger at the Acme, and she hated bagging. And her highest strength was social intelligence. So what she had to do was to figure a way, out a way to bag using social intelligence. So she resolved to make the encounter with her the social highlight of every customer's day. Now notice she failed at this all the time, but she put what was best in her on offer all the time. Well basically when you do random assignment placebo controlled tests of that, you find people who do this uh, six months later are less depressed and, and happier. So that's the kind of individual thing we do. Uh, for the last decade we've been taking these 12 to 18 techniques uh, none of which are, are uh, uh, terribly hard to do to schools uh, around the world. And we train teachers in these principles and techniques. And then we measure for the next couple of years versus controls the depression, the happiness, the anxiety, the conduct of their students. And basically we found in 21 replications around the world that when you teach teachers these techniques of positive education, that the students are less depressed, less anxious, and have better conduct. Um, so um, it, I found myself, uh, to my great surprise, at the Pentagon uh, two years ago with the chief of staff. And he said to me, uh, suicide, post-traumatic stress disorder, divorce, substance abuse, depression, what does positive psychology say about that, Dr. Seligman? Uh, and I said, sir, um, the reaction, post-traumatic post stress disorder is a particularly nasty combination of anxiety and depression. And the reaction of human beings to extreme adversity is Gaussian. And on the left-hand side, you have people who fall apart. And I understand you're spending $10 billion a year treating them, and you should continue to do that. In the middle, you have resilience. And that's most people. And what that means operationally is that people go through a very hard time, but uh, three months later, by psychological and physical measures, they're back where they were. And then most interestingly, there's this huge group on the right-hand side that Nietzsche was right about. If it doesn't kill me, it makes me stronger. These are people who show post-traumatic growth, people who, by our measures a year later, after going through terrible times, by physical and psychological measures, are stronger. Um, uh, whereupon I watched something I've never seen in my life happen, unlike you. General Casey ordered that from this day forward, positive psychology and resilience will be taught in the entire United States Army and measured. And so that's what I've been doing for the last two years. Uh, every month, oh, and he said to me, you know, the general staff has read your stuff about teachers. We see you teach teachers. You measure the students. That's the Army model. I said, it is. He said, yeah, we have 40,000 teachers in the Army. I said, you do? He said, yeah, the drill sergeants. Uh, <laughs> so your job, Marty, will be to take all 40,000 drill sergeants and teach them. So every month now, 150 drill sergeants come to the University of Pennsylvania for 10 days, and we uh, uh, take them through a course on flourishing and these principles. Uh, 
and it's, this is a work in progress, but it's the most uh, uh, important work I've ever been involved in. Um, so, um, uh, flourishing in individuals, uh, flourishing in schools, can you make the army flourish? How about nations? Does that make, any, does it make any sense to ask and this is where we're starting to talk about a positive human future. Usually when we measure nations, when we measure GDP or unemployment or uh, illness statistics, we're measuring what's wrong. Now, if you're following what I'm saying, I'm saying that the downstream effects of flourishing not only involve more positive emotion, better relations, more meaning, more accomplishment, but it turns out people who are flourishing are more productive at work, they're physically healthier, and they're at peace. Uh, and so uh, there is the beginning, both in France and the UK, of the measurement of flourishing uh, by entire nations. So this is a, a new study by Felicia Huppert of the Wellbeing Institute at Cambridge. What she does is ask the kinds of questions we look at uh, 2,000 people in each of 23 European Union nations. And what you can see here is 33% uh, of Danish adults are flourishing by the criteria I'm talking about, 18% um, of Brits and 6% of Russians. Uh, so uh, it, it's, uh, we believe it's, it's measurable, the, the measure, the measure, you know, you have measurement errors and, and the like. But the, the measurement of these uh, dependent variables is becoming more and more sophisticated. So uh, one wants to ask the question, and uh, uh, I know David Cameron and Sarkozy both take this seriously, particularly if, you're, if your economy, if the best you can do in leading a nation is to stop the hemorrhaging economically, uh, uh, will that get you reelected? Well, I don't think so, but if you change the nature of the game, so what government is about is the increase in well-being of a nation, then you might ask the question, does the policy you institute increase well-being as well as does it increase economics? So that's what's going on nationally, and um, the uh, moonshot of this, so, uh, and this is why I'm excited to talk to a powerful group like this. Um, so I've argued that when individuals are flourishing, when they have positive emotion, engagement, meaning, good relationships and accomplishment, uh, that health problems are less and aggression is less and productivity is higher. So imagine 51% that in the year 2051, 51% of the world's population will be flourishing. Uh, so that's, that's the moonshot of this, and, and sort of let me conclude with some thoughts about that. Uh, uh, so this says that by measures of positive emotion, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment, is it possible that in 40 years, half the world's population can be flourishing? So what is the relationship of that to the technology that uh, you are the leaders of? Well, one of the fascinating things we were talking about this morning with Google Earth is uh, uh, given that there, so the, it turns out every positive emotion relationships, meaning accomplishment, all have a lexicon. It turns out there are 80 positive emotion words and uh, there are about 80 positive relation words. Uh, so if you think about uh, what's going out every moment uh, on the web is words, you can actually measure the lexicon, the use of these words. So you can do mapping onto Google Earth and using time scale and looking at events. You can ask the question, to what extent does flourishing, how much flourishing is there in the world? Uh, how quickly does positive emotion damp after the Phillies win the World Series, if you're mapping uh, uh, this locally over time? How quickly does hate damp. So you can actually ask the question globally, uh, uh, how flourishing is a city, a nation uh, at any given moment? Uh, and so I, I believe that is an important possibility here. And very importantly, poli public policy follows from what you measure. 
And what we've measured in public policy for more than 100 years is GDP and unemployment. And so that's what policy is driven around. But if you believe, as I do, uh, Jim, that uh, uh, what is GDP for? So one possible answer to that, GDP is a surrogate variable for human flourishing. On that grounds, you say, well, let's measure the real thing and ask the extent to which public policy changes human flourishing. Um, and another great possibility uh, is actually viral gaming. That is, uh, most of our gaming is shoot 'em up games now. But there is reason to believe that you can use the principles of shoot 'em up games to uh, build strength and to become the grand master of positive relationships and the like. And indeed, there are gamers who work on this. So the final thing I want to say is I've, I've, I've said that there is good reason to think that uh, when individuals are flourishing, you can measure it. Uh, and that uh, when they're flourishing, health problems are fewer, they're more productive and the like. Uh, the same may be true of nations. What is a flourishing corporation? Uh, and uh, so individual is flourishing if PERMA is large. A nation is flourishing if PERMA is large. Um, can we in expand the definition of what the bottom line is? Uh, so I, I, I know all of you will be forever tied to shareholder equity. But one can also ask, in the same way one asks of GDP, to what extent is this corporation increasing positive emotion in the people who work for it? How good are the relationships? And you can quantify that. How much meaning do people who work in your corporation have? So on this notion, a flourishing corporation is, uh, has a different bottom line uh, from the traditional bottom line. It's a combination of achievement, accomplishment, and of flourishing. Now, I want to close by, by uh, asking historically something about, uh, is, is this possible? Is, 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 is this just uh, uh, a nice positive vision that could never take hold in, in real politique? Uh, Florence in 1450, as you know, became enormously wealthy uh, based on Medici banking genius, essentially. And uh, under the leadership of Cosimo the Elder, it asked the question, what, sh what should we, uh, Florence was at peace, it was in surplus, it was not in civil turmoil, it was not in famine, not in plague. It asked the question, what should we do with this surplus? And the generals said we should conquer the peninsula. And indeed, Florence could have done that. But what Florence decided to do with its surplus was to invest it in beauty, in beauty. And they gave us what 200 years later was called the Renaissance. Now, I'm not suggesting that, that the positive human future is about our taking up sculpture. Rather, what I've tried to define is the elements of a positive human future. I believe the United States and the wealthy nations of the world stand at a Florentine moment, and it is vouchsafed to us to decide that the human future will be about the building in our citizens of positive emotion, of relations, of meaning, and accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Seligman, for that wonderfully rich and provocative presentation. You can see why his work has had such influence around the world and all the questions it raises in our mind. We'll save most of those till later on. There's only one that I can't contain myself for right now, which is after the 40,000 drill sergeants have been through the positive uh, flourish course and they make the next basic training movie, what are they going to say instead of, hey, maggot? There's going to be some, some replacement for, hey, maggot. So you can, uh, you can tell us the answer to that one later on. For the next stage of our exploration of leadership, we're going to hear from Dr. Sanjay Jha, who is the co-CEO of Motorola and the CEO of Motorola Mobile. He was born in India. His higher education was in the UK. He spent 14 years at Qualcomm, and in the last two years and 14 days, as he uh, informs me, but who is counting, he's been in the middle of a very celebrated transformation at, at, at Motorola. So we're going to talk about what he's learned from this experience, his observations of the mobile world, his thoughts about the computing future. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sanjay Jha. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Let me start, before we get to talking about your recent business experience, with a carryover question from our first session. You heard a lot of presentations about the relative secular decline of the United States and some Western economies in general relative and specific to China and India. You're part of the movement that, in my view, has always strengthened the United States, that is, its abilities to attract talent from around the world. How do you feel about the sense of the mood of American declinism you heard this morning? Uh, my general view is that uh, it's uh, certainly we, over the last few years, we've gone through a process where there is a need for renewal in the United States. But the strength of US has always been the ability to attract some of the brightest and the best people. I think probably if, if there is one concern is our, some of our immigration policies are getting in the way of being able to attract those folks. But nonetheless, I think this constant sense of renewal that's built into um, the technology as well as the culture of US, I think, uh, enables us to compete as effectively as ever. I mean, there's no doubt that there were excesses in the, in the economic system, but equally there is no doubt that there is more investment being made in the next generation technologies here in US than nearly anywhere else. So I, I, I look at what we have done with the cloud computing, Google at the head of that, I look at what has happened to the US auto industry. I look at Motorola in, in the cell phone business, um, last really important cell phone manufacturer. And I think that there is every capability for us to reinvent ourselves here in the United States. I remain um, very, very optimistic. And so your Indian counterparts, a generation younger than you, would they be as interested in coming to the US as you were? I, I, I think uh, it will depend on a number of things. I think uh, our education system here still continues to be some of the best. I think that certainly is attractive. I think if, if we continue to create corporations like Google, like Motorola, I think they'd be interested. But uh, more and more, I think a uh, vast majority of Indians are now staying in India and creating opportunities. But we shouldn't see that as lack of opportunity for our corporations. I think that that creates vast opportunities for us in those countries also. Let's talk now about your current company, about Motorola. You've been there a little more than two years, as you were saying. Describe, if you would, the situation that faced you when you arrived and what you've learned from your decisions, good and perhaps less good since then. But we'll assume all good. Well, in 2006, we had 28 billion of revenue at the back of the Razor franchise. And post the Razor franchise, I think uh, uh, we were losing money at the rate of about a billion dollar a quarter. Um, it was um, a pretty uh, dire situation. I think there, uh, it was broadly being discussed that we should shut down uh, the handset business in, uh, in Motorola. And I was at that time relatively comfortable position of chief operating officer of a Google-like franchise. And uh, I made the decision to move to Motorola and take the, the challenge of turning around Motorola, uh, largely because I fundamentally believe that there is probably a larger opportunity here in, uh, in technology, in the, the uh, combination of internet and uh, making it mobile, delivering content and information in a mobile environment. And I, I, I just believe that that is the largest technology opportunity that there ever has been. Mm -hmm. And I felt that at Motorola, given its brand name, given the, uh, its distribution reach, I could make a difference. So that led me to that place uh, where I said, yes, I will take on this job from really a place of great comfort. Um, and I, I think. I think the thing that I found was the, this almost complete lack of uh, optimism inside the organization. There have been seven precedents in the course of three years at that organization. So there was clearly a leadership vacuum uh, uh, at Motorola. But uh, the bigger issue was that I think everyone there was looking for the next razor. Uh, it was still a, a company which was looking for a voice-centric device rather than embracing the almost seismic shift that was occurring in technology at that time. And I think the biggest cha change for me was to uh, get people to buy into that vision while I was taking one and a half billion of cost out of the organization. And, and so what, um, as you look back on these two years, uh, a question both, is there anything you would do differently? And you have a, a colleague, you know, Mr. Elop, who's now who's taking on a similar challenge at, at Nokia. You don't want to be advising your competitors, but if someone were advising him based on your last two years, what, advi what recommendations do you think they would offer? 
Um, I <laughs> Uh, advising your competitors is an exercise in futility, so I won't, I won't uh, do that. But I think first thing I would say to Stephen is to make sure that he connects with the Finnish culture in some way. I think almost the biggest challenge in front of him is to be able to make sure that he gets the information that allows him to make rational decisions. And uh, I, I, I was happy to see Finland was third on the list of very happy countries, <laughs> flourishing countries. That certainly is a positive thing that he will have to tap into. But th there, is, there is a very strong cultural element in Finland, and he has to make sure that that cultural element is aligned with his strategy. Anytime strategy and culture collide, uh, strategy always loses. So it, it ha th there has to be an alignment. Um, that's probably the second thing on a more personal level, I would say, is that he needs to have a confidant who, who's connected to the Finnish culture that he can lean on and learn from. Uh, strategically, I won't advise, but uh, live, moving aside to Motorola, moving back to Motorola a little bit, I think that that was probably the biggest challenge. I came from the West Coast, and uh, Motorola is a Chicago uh, Midwest com uh, con uh, company where the winters are extreme. And, and, and it, it, it formulates a certain culture um, and a certain way of looking at the world. And, and my, my, my view, my, probably the largest contribution at, in Chicago has been to make it feel like a high technology company rather than a Midwest hardware company. And, and I, I would say that Steve has to figure out with clarity what is the strategic direction that he wants to take and communicate that and align it as well as he could with the culture of the company. And let me ask you a little bit more about making Motorola feel like a high-tech company, having it feel like a, a startup. Professor Seligman was telling us about ways you can learn different kinds of, of performance. It's relatively easy in the startup, especially you know, in, in, on the West Coast, to have a certain esprit. But if startups succeed, they become mature companies, and they That's become right. more set in their ways. How exactly? Did you try to do this at Motorola, and what lessons do you extract from that? I, I, very specifically, I, um, I picked four groups that I thought were doing very, uh, very, very advanced work at that time, and I made them uh, successful. I rewarded them. I gave them uh, resources to make them successful, and that success was the basis on which I think uh, a, a organization saw where we wanted to head. Th there were a very small number of small successes, and we built upon them one at a time. And I think that that was the core of it. I think. Uh, being clear about the strategy and being clear on, on who are the key people who will drive that success to the next level was important for us. Uh, as, as, I, as I think about uh, how do you keep that startup culture in large organizations, I think uh, my, my fundamental sense is that new ideas can only be born when some, there's, there is some uh, dying of the old ideas. And, I, and how you kill old ideas whose time uh, has come and passed, I think uh, that became important for us. We weren't making money. One of the big things for me at Motorola was that there was no doubt that we were in crisis. There are lots of companies around the world who, are, who have five, seven billion of cash flow who are, in my opinion, in technological crisis. But it's very difficult to bring transformation if there is no sense of that crisis, that sense of imminent death. And I, I, I felt that we had that. And that was a, a huge advantage to me in being able to convince people that we needed to do things differently. In terms of startup, I think, I, I think in terms of innovation, uh, again, I, I have always felt that the innovation, there is an innovating class in every company. To innovate, you must have understanding of a broad range of subjects, and, and the confluence of those subjects creates the innovation. And it, it, it's, it's a matter of sponsoring and providing room for those, that innovating class to de develop new ideas. That was the core of it. I, I felt I, I had to connect with uh, maybe 50 to 100 core engineers in a company in, in, at Motorola who were doing things of consequence and give them room and give them resources to succeed. And if those engineers, the ones you are trying to enlist in this cultural change, if they were explaining your message to their friends and their coworkers, what would be the distilled version of the message that they were, you were trying to impart to them? I, 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 that's a good question. I, 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 would, I would think that they would say that this convergence that, that we're seeing of, of wireless um, mobility, you've seen iPad, you've seen smartphones, our own droids, that that um, is the path for us to grow at Motorola and that that, that, that alone is the way for us to move forward. Um, that, that all the other work that was going on, I, I took a huge amount of cost out of that and that, that they must find to align with that, and if they didn't align with that, then we, we, I, I don't think we would succeed. I think, I think that this central focus on one single thing that was, the, that was going to be our future, 
I think that's hopefully the message that they deliver. Great. Let me ask you about a couple of topics relatively in the news now. Under your leadership, Motorola has made a big bet on Android. That's and right. Could you describe the operating system environment, the operating system struggles as you see them in the mobile space? So uh, obviously there, there, there are two fundamental uh, views. One is open, view, open, horizontal operating environment like Android, perhaps Windows Mobile. Um, and the second one is RIM and Apple with their vertically integrated systems and, and closed systems. Um, my, my view is that I, I, I think that either of the two ways, the, the close integration of hardware and software and end-to-end -end service delivery is going to be the way to meet consumer requirements. And I think it's possible to do, do that both in a horizontal way, in an open way, in the Android way, and in a controlled environment in the way that Apple delivers that uh, experience. Uh, I, I actually think that the pace of innovation, though, in the open environment has proven to be much, much higher. Um, RIM clearly has a franchise. I think time will tell as to how innovative they will be and how they can sustain that pace of innovation. But if you look over the last two years, I think the pace of innovation in the Android fran franchise and Android ecosystem has, has been meaningfully higher in my view. And, and as a result of it, I think we are clearly now seen as the contender uh, to the Apple franchise. And I believe that over a short period of time, I think you will see us delivering much higher quality of experiences because of this sense of openness, because of our ability to garner innovation from lots of different places. And, and so I, th I think both of them are viable economic models, yeah. but I think in the long term, the open model seems to, at the present time, delivering much higher rate of innovation. And here's a related news, uh, news question, the whole net neutrality uh, debate. Our sponsoring institution, Google, here has recently and somewhat controversially taken a stand with Verizon with their manifesto on net neutrality. Could you describe what you see as the merits of this issue and how you think it will and should play out? Well, so, certainly, I think uh, the ability to deliver all applications and all services without regard to who is delivering it and what services are being delivered. I think that in principle, that's a fundamental principle that must be uh, supported very strongly. On the other hand, I think that we need to understand that uh, Verizon or AT&T probably invest 50 to $20 billion in capital expenditure every year. And we must have an economic system which gives them motivation to continue to invest that. Uh, only two years ago, we, we could only get, I don't know, 10 to 20 kilobits per second data rate. And now we can get megabits per second of data rate. On, and, and as a result of it, it's enabled the level of innovation 50% of all phones sold in the United States are smartphones. Without that data network, there is just not that innovation. So I, I think as, as much as we want to make every application available in a uniform way, we need to make sure that the economic incentive to invest that kind of capital expenditure doesn't go away. And I, and I, I just think that there are some very complex issues here. Um, which, which, without going to the details, I, I would simply say that that economic incentive has to be in place. Right. And just so to, to make, just follow up for one, one further turn, the basic division that, that Google and Verizon proposed, which is in the wired infrastructure, you'd have sort of strict net neutrality, but not in the wireless. Is that a, from your point of view, a sensible guideline going forward? It, it, they, the two networks certainly um, are fundamentally different. In wireless space, if you want to deliver quality of service and the same, uh, that the cost of that is dramatically different. And there's no way that they, they have to be, uh, th th there's absolutely uh, agreement that they have to be treated differently. Right. Yeah. We only have about two more minutes here. I want to ask you a, a final question before we bring you back for, for the panel. We heard in the previous presentation from Pre Professor Seligman trying to be specific about what it means to be hopeful, what it means to be optimistic. In your business, um, innovativeness, uh, risk taking, et cetera. These are the mantras everybody, um, everybody talks about. But in specific, what do you do to try to have learned innovativeness, to cultivate what's the right degree of risk taking, and how do you do it among your uh, employees? With great deal of difficulty, I, <laughs> I think. But, but, but I, I, I think uh, the, the notion of flourishing seems to be such an important notion. And, and I, I actually really, uh, just listening to Professor Seligman, I was thinking that we ought to start measuring the quality of our innovation as, as it correlates to the quality of flourishing in, in, in the organization. Uh, the, the, I, I, I just think, again, I, I, the, the way to answer your question more precisely, I think um, what I like to do is to allow people to take risk, but um, uh, try to kill as many projects early as I could as, as they begin to seem like they're not going to deliver mm -hmm. the results. Um, starting many different projects uh, is, seems to be the right thing. But continuing those projects to conclusions 
virtually always guarantees that none of them succeed. So the decision to decision to kill projects is nearly as important for us as decision to start. I think the threshold for starting projects I have kept to be quite low, but the threshold for letting them continue beyond a certain phase I have kept quite high. Oh, so you're, you're fa the fail quickly motto is Absolutely fail to quickly. move ahead in innovation. Yeah. Yeah. There's many more things I'd like to ask you. I think we've come to the end of this session now. So, so please uh, sit with me here while we introduce the next session, then we'll both come back uh, jointly for the panel. Next session, we're going to have Edgar Bromfen, who you all know as chairman and CEO of the Warner Music Group, and he's going to be interviewed by Michael Fitzgerald, who is an accomplished technology journalist and interviewer. He's now a Neiman Fellow at Harvard. He's uh, written for The Globe, The Economist, New York Times, ZDNet, and been on TV. So please join me now in thanking Dr. Jaw and welcoming Michael Fitzgerald and Edgar Bromfen. Edgar, it's great to be here with you. I, I, I have Good a question. Here. I have a question for you uh, related to you know what Marty was talking about in his presentation, which is: Are, are you a pessimist or an optimist? Uh, <clears throat> well, let's see. I I bought a music company and chose to run it for the last six years. <laughs> you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could call you a glutton for punishment, Edgar. Yeah, I mean. Well. Probably that too. Yeah, so, so, and indeed, when you when you bought uh, bought into Warner Music Group, uh, certainly, I, I don't think anyone would have said you were purchasing a company that was in an industry that was flourishing, uh, and furthermore was not likely to flourish. This was more like, you know, joining Eeyore in the seventh circle of hell. <laughs> when you come into that kind of environment, maybe it was a sick circle. But I know, I mean, they told me this wasn't going to be a hostile environment. <laughs> But no, when you, when you come into a place like this, as a, as a leader, and this is, this is a panel about, a session about leadership in, in difficult times, and, and you came into what was a very difficult place. What, what, did you, what did you say coming in, I have to take these steps to try to rally people and, and let them know that, that, uh, that, that we have a positive future? What, what was on your mind? Well, I, I, I think that, um what Sanjay said is important. I think, first of all, the, the most important thing that you can deliver to an organization is clarity. They have to have, they have, to have a, a vision. And, and, and additionally, what Sanjay said is that you know, not, nothing helps you deliver clarity like a crisis. So there was no question that Warner Music and the entire music industry was in crisis when, when, when we got there, um, which made people uh, uh, more willing to focus on what, what we thought the future was. And, the first thing we had to do, unfortunately, was uh, set an economic structure that more closely fit our opportunity. Uh, and that was difficult to go through, but we went through that on day two. Uh, yeah. So uh, th that was announced and done so that, so that people could look to the future uh, and not be paralyzed by what was going to happen next and who was going to uh, have their job. And then what we said was, we think there's a huge future for content and for music, and I'm still hoping we were right. Um, uh, because it's taken longer uh, than I think it should have, but I'm very hopeful that the things that are now happening very much as a result of the innovations that, that Google has created through Android uh, and the ability now of wireless networks uh, to deliver content and information uh, in more seamless ways, uh, I, I think we'll, we'll see content generally and music specifically uh, start to grow again. It's, it's, it's a more important product in people's lives than it ever has been. Uh, fewer people are paying for it, but I think that's principally because there isn't a form or a forum that makes it easy for them to do so. And, and I think if we can get the, the portable model right, which is reasonable in terms of cost, uh, accessible, uh, and, 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 and uh, e easy in terms of usage, I think there's an enormous future. And I brought this actually up on stage to, as a prop so we could talk about some of that because I know that that was something that even, even in 2003 when this was probably not even a glimmer of a, uh, of a figment of someone's imagination, you, you had this, this vision. Uh, but you had to be tactical first. And so you, you mentioned you came in on, and on day two you made some economic adjustments. Th those were cutting 25% of the workforce. Um, just sort of straight off and killing one of the labels that was a major label within Warner. I mean, those are hard decisions. You had probably then to deal with some shell-shocked employees. And, and I'm curious about tactically what you decided to do to kind of go out there and say, okay, now we're going to move forward. Well, first of all, there is, there is nothing more important 
I, I think, than a culture. And then I think, uh, I, I heard the CEO uh, once in a, in a panel was asked the question, if you could get your organization to do one thing better than it currently does, what would that be? And remarkably, his answer, which I certainly wasn't expecting, was listen. And, and, I, and I thought that was a great answer, but then it occurred to me that there are certain conditions that are requisite to be able to listen. Uh, so if you're fearful for your job, you can't listen. Uh, if you think there is no future, you can't listen. So you have to create a culture where, in order to get people to change, and frankly, most incumbent companies in transforming industries don't survive. Okay, so if we're going to be any different, it's because we're going to have to listen and learn how to do new things. So the first thing really I did was to go out and, and talk to people in town halls and, and, and email people directly and, and, and answer their questions uh, and, and, and frankly ask and answer the questions they were too afraid to ask. Like, you know, now that my best friend's been fired, am I next? Uh, and, you know, the answer to that was, was no. Uh, it, it's done, it's over, we can look forward, and here's, here's what we're going to do and here's how we're going to do it. Um, and getting people to buy into the fact that the person at the top of their company actually liked the product that they were producing, believed in, in people's ability to, to, do, their, to do their jobs and, and would, would fund and support them and then recognize and reward them was the message that needed to get out and needed to get out broadly and quickly so we could move forward. You also had the, the situation of, of you were a significant investor in the group that purchased Warner, but you had a series of partners uh, that, uh, that put up more money than you did. And you had to, I think, certainly in the wake of, of purchasing them, I mean, you, you returned your money very quickly. You returned their money very quickly um, uh, through a, a very successful IPO. But you also had to do a lot of sort of managing of, of their expectations. You, your company is a very different kind of company from the ones that, that they've been dealing with. Can, can you talk a little bit about how that was a, how, how you had to deal with sort of managing them as well as this cultural sort of shift? In, well, my financial and... partners, I, I think, had never at that time really got, got involved in a media company or particularly a content company. And, and I think their expectation, their history was that most of the companies they bought were pretty much like other companies that they bought. And there are, there are similarities in, any in, in, in all industries. I mean, there's revenue and there's, there's the cost that in between and then there's profit and it's a question of how you, you, you manage that. But creative businesses, film business, music business, uh, they really are different, frankly, than, than many other businesses. And, and uh, I told my partners when we signed the contract, I said, congratulations, gentlemen, you've just landed on Mars. Uh, and they were like, no, don't worry. It's, you know, we've seen this all before. And within a couple of months, they're like, what the hell is this? Um, so part of, my, part of my job was not only trying to make the, the vision understandable uh, and, and compelling to the employees, but also to the, to the investors as well. And, and I think just for the, the, the folks who are in the technology industry, one, one of the things that I found when I was writing about Warner Music recently was, was that you, you have an industry that, that I think as you put it, it, it creates something out of nothing in effect. You're, you're sort of tapping into human genius and figuring out ways to capitalize that and it's a very subjective kind of industry. Um, it, you had mentioned to me at one point that, that you had a discussion with, with the partners about, uh, the, the, your fellow investors about um, you know, what people were getting paid in your industry to produce things. And, and how did you kind of manage them through, through that uh, and sort of make them less, help them understand that this is the way this business operates? It's well, it's difficult in front of this audience because generally this audience thinks that everybody in the media business is wildly overpaid. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's probably except, largely true. Except me, I'm not wildly overpaid. Um, that's, that's probably true, but it, you know, it's, a, it's a little bit like how much you know, does Lipton pay the, 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 the tea taster? I mean, if you're in a business like the film business where you're investing probably a billion and a half dollars a year, two billion dollars a year in a film, in a film slate, and, and you've got an executive who can improve your profit, profitability rate from 20% of those pictures to 40% of those pictures, the increase in your profitability is enormous. How much would you or your competitors pay to have that person work for you? And so the people who can make those editorial decisions and make them well are enormously valuable to Warner Music and to our competitors and to other, and other content companies. That's not to suggest that then everybody else in the company should be paid over the odds, but, but those people are very well paid and the levels of those pay packages are simply things with, with, with which private equity uh, was completely unfamiliar, which made for many um, amusing and um, 
otherwise colorful conversation. <laughs> but, and, and these people are still with you, yes? Yes, they're, they're, it's only because they can't get out. I think. <laughs> uh, but but all, all, no, all the original partners are still, are still there six and a half years later. I mean, it, it, it helps that all of our equity was returned in the first nine months. So in a sense, they're playing with the house's money. But nonetheless, they've been incredibly supportive partners. And, and when you went into these town halls that you were doing in places, would this kind of stuff come up as well? Uh, I mean, what were the kind of questions people were asking you? And Look, people are concerned about people are concerned about first themselves, yeah. right? Which is, do I have a future? Can, will I be able to go home? You know, tell my family I, I'm still employed. That that was really the first thing to get over. And then, and then it was okay. But is there a future for this business? And if that future is, what is it? And and of course, it wasn't following the old model. So we had to, you know, we had to introduce. You know, a, a bunch of different business models, and we were actually the first in the industry to do that. Um, we'll, we'll probably get a lot of pushback this afternoon for what we call our 360 model, uh, where when we sign an artist now, we sign an artist only if that artist is going to produce, uh, sorry, um, we're going to share with the artist not just in recorded music revenues, but in all the revenues that that, 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 that artist brand creates. Um, and, the, and fundamentally, the way I look at the music business is we're a venture capital business. But instead of investing in 20 or 30 or 40 companies, we're investing in some like number, depends on the country, number of artists. And there's no particular reason, if we're going to be the risk capital, why we shouldn't participate in the brand that, we, that we're building and in all aspects of that brand. And frankly, if we can't, we don't sign that artist, full stop. None of our competitors will ever lose uh, an, an artist to us because we gave up on that, uh, on that principle. Uh, and when we, when we introduced that principle, all of our uh, labels said, we'll never sign another artist. And I'm like, well, that's okay, because we're losing money every time we do. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if our competitors want to commit economic suicide, you know, so be it. Um, so you know, that's, been a, that's been a difficult model. It's been difficult for the managers, agents, and lawyers uh, to accept. But frankly, you know, we, we are the risk capital, and Remarkably, in the 10, 12, 15, whatever years of the internet uh, and the ability for fans to discover artists on their own, et cetera, there really has not been one single sustained commercial career of an artist that came through the internet and not through a, a, a recording company. Well, but it's, it's, only, I mean, it's only been 15 years. I mean, it's right. not necessarily a lot of well, time. And, and do you think that might start to change 15 years out? There, there will, I think there will be exceptions. But I think fundamentally, um, the, the notion that record companies uh, are, are irrelevant uh, is basically based on the principle that record companies provide a distribution. And now that that distribution uh, uh, is less necessary, or, or it, because it, it is still actually fairly necessary, but it's, that's a misconception. The value of, of record companies really was not in distribution. In, in fact, if you think about it, somebody like Madonna or anybody else could have hired any record company to simply physically distribute her, her, her records for a fee. The value of, uh, of content companies, record companies, uh, uh, creative content companies, is really in the editorial function, which is tr trying to determine all those people, the difference between those people who are very good musicians and people who can actually be commercially viable musicians, hmm. and then in the marketing and promotion uh, of those. That's the value add. Distribution really is, is a commodity, and, and it's really always been a commodity, and, and therefore I think that's where people misunderstand the value of a record company. And in fact, from a, you mentioned Madonna. She was uh, probably the most famous defector uh, to, to, uh, from Warner Music. I think it was 2007. She went and, and did a, a 360 deal of her own with Live Nation. So there were, there were other, other companies trying to do this, this 360 idea as well. Talk about, well, but, but you're still doing your distribution, actually. Yeah, but, but we don't pay retail. Okay, so we only do 360 deals with artists that we're signing. Yeah. You know, M Madonna or Green Day or you know, uh, U2, not our artist, but you know, any of these great artists, they know what their value is. And whoever w wants them is going to pay that or more, which certainly Live Nation did in the case of Madonna. We, 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 we only sign this with, with, with younger acts uh, so that you know, w we make the investment in their career and we can share as their partner in success if it if they're successful. So we just have a couple minutes left. One of the things uh, that, I, that I, I wanted to talk about was 
changing of sort of the mind shift of culture, if you will, to use our mind shift theme, because I think you've, you've pulled that off at Warner. Um, you brought back people who, who were part of its storied past. Why did you do that? You know, it's very difficult. I've, I've been in both sides of being acquired and acquiring. And, and by the way, both roles are difficult. Uh, but there is an art to acquiring. Uh, and and you've, when you acquire a, a business, you've got to, just like coming into a family, by marriage or whatever, you have to learn, you have to respect the culture of, the, of, of that unit. And one of the ways that we could tell the people at Warner that we respected who they are and, and, and why we purchased them was to bring back some of the people who were still incredibly interested and incredibly viable, like Mo Austin at Warner Brothers, Jack Holtzman, who was celebrating this year the 60th anniversary of, of Electra Records, and, not, and then he also founded Nonsuch Records. He founded Electra when I think he was 19. Um, and and we, we brought these people back to say, you have a rich and deep cultural history. These people can still add value. We, we care a lot about that. Uh, and while we're going through all this change, we, still, we, we also want to recognize you know, what brought us here and, and to sort of create some ballast for the people as, as we went through and, and, and continue to go through this enormous change. And I think the, the last thing in terms of mind change that I'd say is you know, there is this issue about open or, or closed, Apple and, and, and Android and others. I think music, too, will go through this issue of, of being both a product company, a industry, which it is now, you buy a song, you buy an album, to being a service business as well where what you're buying is not so much songs or albums, but access, the ability to share, the ability to playlist, the ability to, 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 to shift content from any device anywhere to another device anywhere. So the, the business is going to be, it will continue to be a product business, but it will, it will also become a service business. And we've got to build different kinds of products and have different kinds of people who can deliver a, com a completely changed business model as technology develops. And you, you're sort of actually also bringing up something that we're seeing a lot of talk about around the idea of the web, that there's a lot of fragmentation going on in the way that we receive information and what we choose to, how we choose to get it. Within, uh, within your own industry, you know, when we were talking back in April, MP3 sales had really slowed down at the time. They haven't really kind of bounced back from that. Uh, and we're, we're seeing, in the meantime, you know, streaming, we're seeing uh, other kinds of formats emerge. We're seeing a variety of different services on devices like these and on other things. What does this sort of, is this sort of flattening something you think is permanent of, of people actually paying for things that they're downloading and these streaming services are really this, that are kind of the beginnings of this idea you're pointing to? Those are, have not been very profitable for, for anybody. Uh, I mean, what do well, we, where are we and where do well, we go from I, I don't think anyone's introduced a viable model, and it's nothing to do with cost. I don't think, I don't think anyone's created a user experience uh, as well as Apple. Uh, and, and integrating hardware and software into a, into, a, into a user experience, I wouldn't have thought, but I'm not a technologist, that it was that hard. But obviously, seven or eight years later, it's very hard because nobody really has done it. And, and we're now seeing the beginnings of the ability of others to do that. So I think as those services uh, mature, you're, you're going to see actually a renewed growth for the industry because making easy, intuitive uh, uh, services w w will, be, will be critical, and, and they're coming. I think too often network operators tried to do it themselves. Uh, technology companies tried to do it themselves. But, but now we, we, we're seeing services that really are robust and intuitive and, 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 and convenient for consumers to access. Um, they're not profitable yet, partly because their business model isn't mature enough, right? Which is, you know, g giving away product to consumers is, is frankly, as, as Sanjay said, it doesn't make sense. There, there's capital investment. We all need to recover that. No one's going to produce music if no one's going to pay for it. Um, and, and so, you know, we've made it very clear that we like all these services, but, but we're not going to give our music away to them for nothing. But we will cooperate with them so that consumers can access music in new and different and I think very exciting ways. And I think the next year or two we'll see, we'll see a real renaissance of, of growth in the music industry, I hope. So, so it you're, you're, almost sounds like you're saying you, you, we have in the industry kind of on a broad scale for consumers what you had in a limited way within Warner, which is there's a lot of instability, a lot of question marks. Uh, and is that slowing demand currently? Is that why we're seeing downloads not really? I think you're seeing downloads slow because there's been no model to replace 
download. So, so you know, the, just like there was when, when, when CDs replaced cassettes and vinyl, there was a huge boom of people replacing their, their catalogs, yeah. and then CD growth slowed. Obviously, with technology, everything moves faster. So you had, a, again, a, a much steeper, faster curve. Now you're seeing more, more moderate growth. But there hasn't been the service model introduced yet. Uh, you only have Apple, and they've done uh, they've done a great job. And and uh, you know, but I do think there will people there will be people who will will compete with them, and that consumers will be able to access music in new and different ways. And so you're 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 and you're positive that we're kind of on the cusp of that. It's sort of a last. Let's be optimistic on our last question. I'm I'm learning. I'm I'm perma. I'm I'm perma. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Edgar. Thanks, Thanks very much. So come on. So we have one more. Um, why don't you sit on that side, if you would? We have, <laughs> we have one more uh, conversation before we have our panel, and then we have our, our surprise. And we're very privileged to have here A.G. Lafley, who I often think of as what business people would want to be when they grow up. Uh, that after graduating from college in the late 1960s, uh, Mr. Lafley had a stint in the U.S. Navy, and then joining Procter and Gamble for a 32-year career, which which had every sort of accomplishment one could want, including president and CEO and chairman. And during the last, I think, 10 years of your stint there, the revenues doubled from 39 billion to 79 billion. Is that approximately right? That's approximately right. Approximately yeah. right, but 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 who's counting? And along the way, has had a reputation for talking about civic responsibility of his corporation, the values within his corporation. And so leadership has been something that you have, have thought about during your entire career. Um, we are nearing, there's a political connection I'm going to make here, we're nearing the 50th anniversary of Dwight Eisenhower's famous farewell address when he left the presidency, which I think, as a one-time speechwriter myself, was probably the finest example of political, um, serious political rhetoric in the United States. You recently gave your version of that a valedictory on leaving Procter & Gamble, where you talked about the values you had learned in your long career of leadership, of citizenship. Would you give us what you think is the most, you know, sort of distilled and extrapolatable version of that message for corporations beyond yours? We must have had a leak. <laughs> um, well, I think, as I recall, um, I tried to distill 32 to 33 years into sort of a handful of principles. And um, the first one was um, see things as they are, not as you want them to be, come to grips with reality. And um, I think in my experience and listening to my predecessors, one of the things that distinguishes optimists and leaders is they come to grips with reality. They see it sooner, they express it more clearly. Um, the second thing is, and this is no surprise, um, I am first, last, and always customer-centric. Um, I was supposedly in what had spent 22 years at one of the most successful consumer products companies in the world, and frankly, our biggest problem in 2000 was we were nowhere near close enough to the consumer. And um, I would suggest the whole discussion or debate about open versus closed systems will be resolved based on what, in the end, the customer wants. So does she or he want, uh, will the open system or the closed system deliver better value? Will it deliver a better experience? Will it deliver the relationship that she wants with her brand and her product and her service? Third thing was I'm a huge believer in innovation. I know I'm in a um, very dull, uh, very mundane industry. We do toilet paper and deodorants and feminine hygiene and lots of exciting stuff like that. But what has distinguished us, and when we have been at our best, we have been the innovation leaders in that industry, and we spend over $2 billion a year in innovation. I think we hold 40,000 patents in the US. I think we have 20,000 pending. So it is an innovation business. The fourth thing was everybody's a leader, and I expected we have a leadership culture. And we have a, a system that's driven by purpose and values strategy and principles, and all I did was try to express what I'd learned, where I thought we were, and I didn't think we had made as much progress as a lot of others thought we'd made in the last decade, and so I said there was plenty of things to do in the decade ahead. I think that was it. <laughs> and I say this, I ask this question with, with great respect. It would be possible to list all the qualities that you have mentioned in a platitudinous way. We should be close to the customer. We should be innovative. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some specific illustrations of what it yeah. took to impose or yeah. uh, evoke these values inside the company? Okay. Um, 
the objective with a customer is to be so close that you understand, in my case, most of the time, her needs and wants, even the ones that she can't articulate. I was probably five years in the company, and um, we had run some consumer research on laundry detergent packaging. And Tide Packaging was rated 4.9 on a 5.0 scale. And I had been out in homes, and I had watched women struggle with our packaging. How do women open a laundry detergent box? None of them use their hands. Why? How much did they spend on the manicure? How much time did they put into the manicure? So they've got screwdrivers and pliers and all kinds of paraphernalia out in their laundry room. And we're getting a 4.9 out of 5 rating, and we think we're making the best package in the laundry detergent industry. And I can go through hundreds of examples like that, where I sat and watched a woman in Japan do her morning you know, uh, skincare ritual. Um, I heard people tell me that something was great, and then you know it clearly, it clearly delivered a subpar performance. So there's a big difference between saying you're going to be close to customers. One other thing, not to belabor this point, I now work in private equity. We have 15 companies, and one of the questions I always ask is, who is your customer? Who's your current customer? And you would be astounded by the number of companies that cannot describe clearly who their current customer is. Innovation, the big breakthrough for us in innovation was we were great at patenting. We weren't getting it commercialized. We weren't connecting it to consumers and markets. So we went to an open innovation system. We called it Connect and Develop. Um, 10 or 15 years ago, maybe 10% of our new brands and products were partnered with at least one outside um, innovation partner. Last year, over half were partnered. And I believe there's no reason why virtually all innovation shouldn't be patented because fundamentally innovation is about association, it's about connection, it's about combining unlikely, unlikely things. And I, and I could go on for each one. So yes, it sounds like a platitude, but if you dig and you dig and you dig and you get it under your fingernails and you get into it every day, it's, it's really important. Um, you mentioned earlier I might have had a leak to some of your utterances inside the company. In fact, we talked about a week or so ago. And something you said then that was fascinating to me is, as you mentioned, you come from a, an industry which is seen as traditional, stolid. People would assume it to be lower technology than, say, Google or Qualcomm or Motorola or whatever. But you said you thought there were some dangers of complacency coming into this kind of high-tech industry, that you thought, tell, tell me, tell the, yeah. share with the audience what we were discussing a week ago. Well, I think we were talking about um, the worst thing that can happen is that you're successful. And the absolute worst thing that can happen is that you're wildly successful. <laughs> because then you become content, OK? You become um, complacent. You can become even a bit arrogant. And all of a sudden, blind spots develop all around you. And they can be blind spots around your technology. They can be blind spots around uh, your business model. They can be blind spots about around your real relationship with your customer. And um, oftentimes, you don't even see the new competitor coming because they're not an expected competitor. They're coming up from underneath. They're coming from the side. So um, we've gotten waxed a number of times. Okay, In the 33 years I was at P&G by by success, you know, by success. And um, we blew up, we created the disposal baby diaper business with Pampers in the early 60s. Um, I think Google's share of searches is somewhere around 64%. We had a 99% share of that <laughs> business. When I joined the company, we had an 85% share of that business, okay? And we introduced a new shape diaper technology. And instead of putting it on Pampers, we introduced a new brand called Loves. And what do you think happened? We split the business in two. So we took Pampers and reduced it to a 45 share. We had a 40 share Loves brand. And Kimberly Clark came right up the center with the next technology. And they, in the US at least, they had the leading um, baby diaper brand. So, I've just seen so many times in so many businesses that you can lose it, you know, because of something you did, because you didn't see something coming, because you didn't have your eyes open, because you became too complacent. And is there any particular way, suppose you are a dominant search company, 
What, what, uh, how would you apply the, uh, you, the logic of what you're saying? Okay, there only, uh, you know, there is no perfect defense, but I believe the best defense is offense. If you don't create the future, you know, you don't want to leave that to your competitor. Second thing um, you have to do is, a tr is attack. You, you have to be willing to attack yourself, right? What's one of the biggest reasons that you don't attack yourself? You don't attack yourself because the economics aren't as good, and they're never going to be as good. You're going to be dealing with maybe higher capital, for sure lower margins, all of the costs of startup, whatever they are in your industry. So you have to be willing, you have to be willing to do that. And then I think the third thing is I'm a, I'm a huge believer in open innovation. And I'm a huge believer in, in partnerships. Um, we talked a lot about our billion dollar brand businesses. One of the ones I'm most proud of is not on the list. It's with Clorox, who's a fierce competitor in, in one industry and who's a big partner in the wraps and bags industry, another very mundane industry. But we, we took their Glad brand, which was a few hundred million dollars, invested three technologies into it, and it's now well over a billion dollar business. And I have to tell you, very few people at P&G wanted to do a partnership with Clorox when the idea was you know, initially raised. So I, I would say that that would be a good place to start. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you about is a big theme of all the presentations so far of the conference has been about learning skills, learning traits that, that you might naively think are just inborn. People are either leaders or not, they are innovators or not, but we talked about ways you can develop these skills. You've placed a lot of emphasis inside the company on training leadership skills. Tell us more about that, if you would. Well, I think I may have mentioned, um, I really don't believe leaders are born. I believe um, they make a choice to lead. Um, you know, in my own case, I was, I was an accidental CEO, probably um, Just a country the block. clearest. No, no, I was pro probably the clearest article written about me was the un-CEO. Um, but sometimes, you know, circumstances, and they can be a cause you care about, they can be something you have passion for. They can be something in your community, you know, wherever, you know, cause you to want to make a difference. And so I believe there's this little spark. Second thing I'm, I'm relatively sure of is that there are some leadership tasks engaging and envisioning. It's part of, part of the responsibility. Empowering and enabling and in the end getting it done, okay, executing. And uh, we have a fair amount of evidence that we can take new hires, we can take 20-year um, veterans, and we can put them through two-day, three-day, five-day courses, and we can inspire leadership. We don't have a style we're selling. We want you to be yourself. But we have, um, probably not unlike what the professor was talking about, we have sort of a set of skills and some basic principles, and, um, and I think they work. And I guess the last thing I would say is we're on, the, we're on the ground in 100 countries. We're selling in over 160. Uh, we're in probably 25 different industries now. There is no way you can survive in this kind of an industry or world unless you have distributed network leadership. Yeah. You know, command and control are over. You mentioned the term responsibility in the answer you, you gave that, which is another theme which has run through all the presentations so, so far. Uh, we heard from Ted Turner about things that he thought the media needed to do differently and citizens need to do and that civic leader and philanthropists needed to do. We heard from Professor Seligman again about the ways to develop the right kind of traits. We heard in the first session about ways in which the Western world needs to shore up various of its traits if it's going to uh, restore its economic fundamentals. Um, this is an audience that is largely, although not exclusively, tech industry people. The tech industry world has been so far still largely in the libertarian phase of its development of thinking, well, we'll just have our innovations and the outside world will take care of it. What message would you give to a tech world audience about responsibilities they have and their products, their own personal lives? Well, I, you know, I start small, all right? So I, I, I think your basic, your first responsibility is to serve a customer, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Peter Drucker, and he said the first purpose of a business is to create a customer and then keep that customer for life. So I think your first responsibility is to really serve your customer. So that means a better value, a better experience, a better product and service. The second thing um, I think very 
I believe very strongly is you have a responsibility to your critical stakeholders. One of the things I did, frankly, was put the shareholder you know, at the bottom of the pyramid, not because the shareholder wasn't important, but if I didn't have it right for the customer, if I didn't have it right with our innovation partners and I didn't have it right with our employees, we weren't gonna deliver for the shareholders, so I just, I just changed the mix. The third thing is um, you have a responsibility beyond your technology, beyond your business, and that's to the communities in which you work and live. And um, our responsibility in, um, in Mandadeep in India is different from our responsibility in Lagos, Nigeria, is different from our responsibility in Cincinnati, Ohio. And then um, lastly, um, you know, I really believe um, you, have a, you have a responsibility to the sustainability of our planet. And um, you know, we, we try to work on our responsibilities in concentric circles. We try to work on them in an integrated way. So we're not fixing technologies and products that are ill-conceived and ill-designed, although we have had to do some of that. Um, and we don't, I mean, we don't get it right most of the time, but we try to get it right a little more often. And, uh, and I think those are some of the responsibilities that we have. We have only two minutes left here, so here's a final question. In retrospect, as you think about your business career at Procter & Gamble, what do you think is the worst decision you made and what we can learn from it, and the, in retrospect, the best decision and what we can learn from it? Uh, I think the best decision was to, um, was really to refocus on the customer, okay, and just put the customer at the center. And I, and we have the customer in most of our buildings every day, okay, and we're in customer homes living it and working it. Um, the worst decisions were um, I should have divested. You know, you're always slow to, capitalism is about creative destruction. And while you create on the one hand, you have to destroy with the other hand. And um, I, I always felt that we were quicker to create than we were to destroy. And um, I should have divested or gotten rid of businesses that um, either were non-strategic, non-performing, or just weren't gonna fit. And um, my biggest miss by far is we got pr the Prilosec switch, we lost the Claritin switch, and, and I had it in my hand, and I deferred to the individual that was running the healthcare business at the time, and I knew in my tummy that I shouldn't have, but we would have had probably the two biggest switches in the last decade if I'd made a good decision there. Um, great. Well, with that, thank you very much. And so let's let's we will stay here. Okay. Uh, more chairs will come up. Our fellow, our previous speakers will come up too. We'll have a panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we will stay here um, immobile. And here's going to be the plan. Yes, Martin Silverman. And yes, everybody up. Oh, wow. And I'm going to have just one question that anybody can answer or not, and then we're going to go to audience questions. So this is your chance to ask questions about all this, this session and earlier ones if you would like to. There are three microphones okay. here, so please go to one of those and queue up. The, the question I have for, for, for any of you is related to the themes of optimism versus pessimism, leadership versus helplessness, et cetera. Um, when I came back from a number of years in living in China, I, I wrote a big article for The Atlantic essentially on the subject of whether America was going to hell. And the conclusion I came to is that the fear that we're going to hell chronically through American history has been what's kept us from going to hell. That the first real Jeremiah sermon on America's fall for, from grace was in 1628. And I said, boy, back in 1620 it was wonderful, but in 1628 things have really gone, gone downhill. So would any of you say on the optimism, pessimism spectrum, hearing all the things we've heard about national and corporate troubles, how do you stand? Are you basically optimistic about the resilient capacity in American culture and American business culture or basically concerned? Who is, is anybody basically concerned, basically um, on the pessimistic side? Good. Well, that's, that's, that's news in itself. <laughs> and, and make the case for your optimism. No, I, I think if you, I mean, aging more than any of us, but you know, those of us who manage businesses around the world and spend time in, in other countries, there's a, lot to, there's a lot to recommend all of them. But I would say with perhaps the exception of China, 
there is no country in the world that has the optimism of, of America. And that optimism, it's just, it's, it's somehow inherent in, in, in our nature. We need to make sure to protect it and to nurture it and to do all the things to, to, to preserve it. But that optimism, that, that belief that we, can, that we can do better than we've done, that the next generation can do better than we've done, that forward-looking sense, it simply doesn't exist in most other countries, and it has served us well for, for centuries, and I think can continue to serve us well. I, I think the fact that we're a nation of immigrants, and you ask, who stays and who leaves, that in general it's optimists who leave and see the future. And it turns out optimism is 50% heritable. <laughs> yes. I, I, I think the notion of immigration has been so central to this country. And I, I, I do think that there are some changes that need to be made in terms of our visa situation, in terms of uh, allowing the people who get educated in this country to find jobs. That has been. If you, if you look at the papers being published, 75% of the papers are now being published by non-Americans out of university, U.S. schools. And, and then we have created an environment where they can't stay in this country. And I think that's, that makes no sense at all for us. And uh, there's been a huge campaign. I think Bill Gates has been leading it. I think Eric's been involved in it. I, I, we, we really need to find a solution to that. I think that's an important part of the renewal that we have in this country. And just on that point, has that situation abated at all in the time since the 9-11 uh, the attacks, which was when you know, the big switch came on visas? Not to my group? view. Not to my view. I think, if anything, it has got slightly worse. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I will invite people who would like to ask questions. I have some more, but I, which I'll, so I'll ask another one, which, which follows that. Yes, a question here? Is it? Yes. Hi. Um, being a musician who comes from a part of the world where there was no business model 20 years ago when I started a rock band, Janoon. Um, yet, you know, the consumer, the customer, the music listener is 1.5 billion people in South Asia. So the business model evolved. How do you, Edgar, this is a question for you. How do you see the business model evolving in the next 10 years, uh, the music model for artists? Um. Well, as I said, I think that there's going to be far more uh, partnership, I think, uh, between artists and uh, their business partners, whoever those business partners may, may, may ultimately be. I think you know, record labels, music publishers will be, will be a part of that. But I think that we're going to see a globalization uh, of, of content that we've never seen before because of the technology uh, that's really here but, but not really deployed in, in, in full force. So that the, the people in the U.S. will be able to listen to your music, you'll be able to listen to their music in a, in a, in a much more free-flowing view way. You'll have playlists that you'll be sharing with people in this country and, and, and all over, and that will allow music to travel in, in ways that it hasn't really been able to travel before. In almost every country outside of Japan, Western Europe, and North America, there is no music model. Music is basically stolen. Uh, pirated, et cetera, and it's impossible for mu musicians to make money other than through live performances and, and other kinds of things. And I really do think that that's another opportunity for, for technology to, to allow compensation to flow so that much more creativity and, uh, will, will, will come to all parts of the world where there are genius musicians. Thanks. So I have a question I'm going to ask Professor Seligman and see if, uh, if the other panelists agree or disagree with, with, with his reply. Um, one could make a case that this is a time of failing leadership on many fronts for the United States in particular. Uh, it's, it is very difficult on the political front to find people who are willing to put interest beyond the next election, the next um, uh, filibuster vote or whatever, talk about you know, the, some of the issues Ted Turner was discussing of long-term issues of, of national welfare and international survival. The financial community is probably in its lowest esteem it's been uh, in, in, in a public view for 70 years or so. My own media uh, establishment, with the exception of Tom Brokaw, is not uh, looked on too well by, by the, the, the world in general. Objectively, is the quality of leadership now any better or worse than it's ever been? And is this something that changes over time? Well, I, I have a confession to make yeah. about leadership. So I, I actually once was the Fox leadership professor. Of, <laughs> uh, every time I hear the word leadership, I hold on to my wallet. <laughs> and let me tell you why. Um, <laughs> I think uh, followership is homogeneous, and I'll tell you what I think it is, 
And I think leadership is domain specific, that it depends on what you're leading. So I believe when I talk to drill sergeants or CEOs about PERMA, that what you want to instill in followers is more positive emotion, more better relations, more meaning, and more accomplishment. So I actually think the measure and the purpose of leadership is PERMA, it's followership, and that's homogeneous. But the way you do this at Procter & Gamble or Motorola or the University of Pennsylvania or the US Army is fantastically different and that the leaders are not interchangeable. So I'm very interested in followership. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I don't think leaders are interchangeable. And I think a big part of what you try to do is find a person's, um, me, help a person find his or her meaning, his or her inspiration, and then find the position for them to play that brings out the best in her. And the beauty of a place like P&G is we have lots of positions, okay? And, uh, but I think that is, I think that is uh, a really important part of it. And if you think about growing over a lifetime, we're going to live longer. You're going to work, we're going to work longer. You know, if companies like ours are gonna have any kind of a chance See, I believe our employees vote every three to five years about, first of all, whether they're going to join us. We don't select anymore. They choose us. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's true at Google, okay? Second thing is, then they re-choose us every two or three years. So we've got to keep winning those elections. And manipulation doesn't work, control doesn't work, none of that stuff works. So they have to be re-energized, they have to recommit. So I, I, I totally agree with you. You know, I can think of a lot of things that you would not want to put me anywhere near because I would make a huge mess of it. But for some reason, I landed in this and it's worked out okay. So we have one more minute here. Did any of you hear anything in your colleagues' discussions that you wanted to second, rebut, or elaborate upon? Just, just uh, uh, Professor Seligman's notion of flourishing is a very central one, I think, uh, that I heard today. Very interesting, and interesting to think about how that concept can be used in corporations in terms of measuring flourishing. And I don't think it's surveys. I think it has to be something much more subterranean than that. I, I, surveys are probably a start, but I, I'd like to hear your opinion as to how that applies to corporations, Dr. Seligman. Um, so I, I've spent most of my life working on negative emotion, <laughs> you know, anger and sadness and anxiety. And there's a very important difference between the positive emotions and the negative emotions. And it has to do, when you're in negative emotion, you fall back on what you already know. It's not an innovative emotion. Mm -hmm. So to the extent, um, if what you're dealing with in your own life, your nation or your corporation, is stopping hemorrhaging, then it's a good idea to be a performance manager about anger and fear and, and, and sadness. But, but all, all of you have spent your life in innovation. And I, I think we know, and both experimentally and, and otherwise, that when people are flourishing and in states of positive emotion, that's when they expand and do things new. And, and that's why my guess would be that for uh, uh, growth, that uh, uh, flourishing and the positive emotions are the evolutionary substratum of what we call positive sum games, growth. There's more to discuss here, but we have time for a, just a two-minute uh, surprise session, which is going to come. And although Professor Seligman didn't know this, this wasn't the setup, his comments about the importance of followership are the exact perfect segue to what we're about to see. So I and my fellow panelists are going to go back to our seats, and Derek Sivers is going to hear, be here to show us a surprise. So please welcome Derek Sivers and thank our panelists. Thank you, Jeff.